Hello again, everybody. Welcome to our service today. We've been working our way through some themes in the book of Proverbs. So we've, uh, we're have we halfway home. We've got three weeks covered, and we're going to go for three more weeks. And I'm just going to be honest with you. We're going after some heavy hitting here for the last three weeks. So I've saved the best for last, as it were. We're going to cover three very relevant and touchy topics uh, these next three weeks. So starting with today, we're going to talk about wealth, money. Uh, next week, we're going to look at laziness and then sexual immorality, the last one. So I hope that you'll join us because it's very practical advice we're seeing in the scripture here. Also for today, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's table. So I encourage you to have some elements on hand, uh, some grape juice or wine, some bread or crackers. We'll be having the Lord's table. I use uh, one of these uh, all in one type of thing. So anyway, that will be at the latter portion of our service today. All right, so we need to be wise about wealth. That's what our discussion is going to be on. Let's open a word of prayer, then we'll get right into the Word of God. Father, we're so thankful for the clear teaching from Scripture, very practical, sound advice here on several different topics. Today, we're going to look about money, which is something that affects all of us. I pray, Father, that we will um, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us about our attitude towards wealth and money. And if there's areas that need to be changing, uh, priorities need to be realigned. I pray that you would alert us to that. So help us now as we study your word in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, so we're in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 4 to 8. Let's see what the word of God says here. Do not overwork to be rich. Because of your own understanding, cease. Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle toward heaven. Do not eat the bread of a miser, nor desire his delicacies. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. The morsel you have eaten, he will vomit up and waste your pleasant words. Hey, there's some good stuff there. You might be thinking, what's the... Money part got to do with the guy with the, who's the miser. Uh, we'll see where there's a connection there. But I want to tell you a story. A number of years ago, I was having a conversation with a pastor friend of mine whose uh, children were, his children were older than my children. Um, and I was saying, hey, uh, what, what's, you know, what do your children want to do when they're going to go to college, university type of thing? And he talked with his daughter. And then he said, he had a couple sons. And I said, well, what are they interested in? And he said, my two sons have decided whatever can make the most money. That's what they want to do. They, they want to find a job that's going to make them a lot of money. And I remember thinking, he laughed about it. It made it sound like um, it was all good. But um, I was really uncomfortable with that. I thought, if that's your motive, you know, the pursuit of wealth is a very dangerous path to be on. Now, I want to make something very clear. If you're watching this, you're saying, well, I'm a person of great means. I, I've been blessed. You know, God's given me a good job. I've got a, a nice home. I is it wrong to have wealth? No, it's not wrong to have wealth. Not at all. As a matter of fact, we need people in the body of Christ who have wealth, who can be a blessing and, and uh, sow into the kingdom of God, support missionaries. Everything takes money. You know, church building, it's upkeep, takes money. Feeding people. Uh, we have programs in our church. We're trying to reach out to our community. Hey, it all takes money. So no, wealth is not the problem. It's what I do with wealth. It's my attitude towards it. If I'm constantly craving for it and desiring it, uh, then there's a problem. As a matter of fact, where it said there, uh, do not overwork to be rich. Um, there's the word there, the Hebrew word actually means to, like a natural desire for food, but an eagerness, an eager desire, a craving, a lusting after, waiting for something longingly. Those of you who have a dog, it's dinner time. You try and enjoy your meal and your dog comes to the side of the table there and looks up at you with those big puppy dog eyes and, you know, saliva drooling from the sides of its mouth. And it knows what you got on your plate that dog wants, right? And so it's this law and they're there and you're saying, no, no, go away, go away to eat your dog food. Or they're not interested in their dog food. They want what you've got. There's a craving. There's a desire. They may have even smelled some of the food that was on the plate and think, oh, come on. That's what he's talking about here. Do not overwork to be rich. Don't cut, let it be the craving, the intense desire. Don't let it be the thing that you are longingly waiting for. You know, if you, if you can catch yourself and say, boy, I, I think I'm a little bit over, too over eager when it's payday or I, I might, you can tell, you know, quite a bit. 
when there's too much of a desire for a while. We're going to take a look. This is going to be more like a Bible study. We're going to look at some key verses. Let's start with Proverbs 28, 20, because, you know, there's a lot of verses in the Bible about warnings about our attitude towards wealth. We're going to hit on a few of these. Proverbs 28, verse 20. Look what it says there. A faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. You see the difference here. It's not, there's nothing wrong with making money and wanting to do well, but he who hastens to be rich. The implication there, by the way, is that you use some unjust means to get rich. You know, you you were so badly wanting to be rich. You were so craving more wealth and to be uh, more material things, uh, so longingly waiting for that, that you resorted to maybe some improper and uh, unsound means of which to get it. Things like bribing somebody, um, you know, ripping them off, overcharging if you're a business person uh, because you want to make more money, or if you're selling something on Kijiji, not offering it at a fair price. Uh, these are all implied in this hastening to get wealth. It's an attitude. So it's not the wealth itself. There's nothing wrong with the wealth. It's, it's our attitude towards it. Let's take a look at another verse there. Proverbs 13, verse 11. It's just really a dangerous area. You know, money is one of those things that it can control us very quickly. It's, and it's something we need. You know, you, you have to you have to have money to buy your groceries, to pay your rent or your mortgage, you know, to, to buy clothes, to, you know, do repairs on your home, whatever. Uh, we need money for everything. So it's, we can't just get away from it. You know, you can't just say, well, I, I, I have this problem with money. I better just get rid of it all in my life. Well, that's probably not going to work. What we're going to need to do is change our attitude, change our heart, uh, our motive. And you might say, I don't know. I struggle with this. This is where we ask God to help us. But Let's look at a few. Of course, his word is going to help us. Proverbs 13, verse 11. Let's see what it says there. Wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished, but he who gathers by labor will increase. There's a good verse that talks about the two ways that wealth can be acquired. One is by dishonest means, ripping people off, bribery, stealing, you know, overcharging, this kind of thing. And the other one is I went to work, I, I gave my employer an honest day's work for an honest day's wage. You labored, you were paid for what you did. It was legitimate. You know, we, we, we shouldn't despise that. You might be sitting in a job and saying, well, I don't care for my job. It's it's minimum wage. I don't feel I'm being paid what I should. But just you know, keep being faithful. God's our provider. Just say, well, Lord, I'll continue to be faithful in this area. And I'm going to believe that you'll give me a, a promotion or help me find another job that more adequately would provide for my needs. But it's so important that we acquire our wealth through proper means, proper attitude, and then not try to get something for nothing. That will be coming up shortly in this message. Let's look at another verse, Proverbs 20, verse 21. So a lot of this is in Proverbs. Jesus talked a lot about money, by the way. We're not actually going to talk about any of the stuff he talked about, but there's a lot of teaching from our Savior about money. Uh, much more than when he talked about prayer and you know, other things we would think that he would talk about. Well, he did talk about prayer because it's very important, but he actually talked about money a lot more. Proverbs 20, verse 21, though. Let's look at what it says there. An inheritance gained hastily at the beginning will not be blessed at the end. I'd say, well, what's that about? Um, as a pastor, I've been in situations that were very uncomfortable where I knew of family members that were kind of looking ahead to what their inheritance would be with a wealthy family member that they knew, you know, they were in their will and almost to the point where um, they were kind of hoping things would move along quicker. I know that sounds just horrible, but hey, our world is filled with sin. People actually think this way, you know, where they're kind of like, well, if this person would hurry up and die. I could get my money sooner. I was in a situation a few years ago where a man was a neighbor person. He wasn't a member of our church or anything, but um, I had some ministry with him and he had three children. He'd been estranged from his children for a number of years, but there had been some coming together towards the end of his life with one of his children. But but one child wanted nothing to do. Uh, when after the father died, the this young man, uh, he served notice to his siblings that um, 
call me when the lawyer cuts the check for my part of the will. And that was the only time he had showed any interest whatsoever. So he was basically just, you know, waiting for his father to die so he could cash in on what the inheritance was. You know, the scripture is very clear. That is a, a very ungodly. Now, this young man didn't claim to be a Christian. He didn't sound like he was very close to the Lord. But the scripture is very clear. An inheritance gained hastily at the beginning. In other words, I'm just after something that uh, I know is coming my way. And I, I want to get it sooner rather than later so I can enjoy myself with it. I mean, that's just a wrong, wrong attitude. It says it will not be blessed in the end. You know, God wants to bless us. And certainly... You know, you might be a person that's leaving an inheritance to your children, or maybe you're someone that's, that's received an inheritance, uh, or you know that you're going to be getting inheritance from maybe elderly parents, this type of thing. It's so important to, to put things into perspective. You know, for me, I want to enjoy, my father's passed away a number of years ago, my mother's still living. I want to enjoy my mom, my relationship with my mom on the years I have left with her. That's what's valuable to me. I don't want to be looking ahead to any inheritance she might be leaving me. No. And, and so I don't want wealth to control me and to soil my, my relationships, not only with my mother, but my relationship with God, right? Let's look at one more uh, from the New Testament. It's uh, 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 11. 1 Timothy 6, 9 to 11. Apostle Paul said something that he's often misquoted on, let me tell you. Um, We'll try to clear that up. First Timothy 6, 9 to, sorry, 9 to 10. Okay, here's what it says. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. For which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now it's often quoted, misquoted. Money is the root of all evil. No, that's not true at all. Money's not the root of all evil at all. It's the love of money, which is the root of all evil. So the Apostle Paul is saying, be careful. Those who desire to be rich, the Proverbs said that in our passage, right? This whole idea of do not overwork to be rich. Cease from that. Because riches sprout themselves wings and fly away. Actually, that's a metaphor used in scripture to talk about wealth slipping through your hands. Okay. Um, in the ancient world, it was a figure. Uh, the figure of a bird flying off was symbolized fleeting wealth. So he says, when you desire to be rich, you overwork and consume yourself wanting to get rich. Actually, what you're doing is... Going onto a path where riches are going to fly away. So the Apostle Paul said, you know, those who desire to be rich, that's their goal. Like those two young men said, I don't care what job I get, I just want to make the most money. You know, you know that's that's a wrong attitude. They this leads us into a pathway where we're going to head into foolish decisions, a foolish lifestyle. There's destruction and perdition, the Apostle Paul said. He said, the love of money, when, when money has us, and it's, it's consuming us, and it's our object of affection. It's a root springing up to all kinds of different evils spring from that. Let's take a look at one of them, which was the rest of our chapter today. Uh, Proverbs chapter 23, now at verse 6 to 8. Do not eat the bread of a miser, nor desire his delicacies. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart's not with you. The morsel you have eaten, you will vomit up and waste your pleasant words. What has this got to do with liking well? The traits of this man, a miser. Let me give you a Bible definition of that. Uh, this being a miser, the essential meaning is the inability to come up to good standards which will benefit himself and others. The inability to come up to the level of good standards which will benefit himself and others. That's the general or the most essential meaning. It comes from a root word meaning to make something good for nothing. A miser, because of the choices he's made in his life, he's good for nothing. He's got all this wealth sitting there and hoarding more and wants more, and he's tight with what he has. He's not a generous man, and he's good for nothing. He could be... He could be uh, 
sponsoring children in different countries through some an organization like Compassion or World Vision. He could be doing so much with as well. He could be helping the people in his community. He could be contributing to his church. He could be giving to, you know, different uh, charities that are helping people all around the world. But no, he's a miser. And so this miser invites you over to his house, hoping that maybe he can get some favors from you. Maybe he, he can add to his wealth, not that he needs it. And so he, he says, help yourself to my meal here. He doesn't really mean it. He doesn't want you helping himself to the meal because there'll be less food for him. Just a terrible attitude there. Look what it says. Don't eat his food. Don't desire his delicacies because they were not given with a true heart. This, so it's a, he says here, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. His mouth says, eat as much as you want. If you want seconds, you can have seconds. That's what his mouth said. But his heart says, I hope he has a small plate. I hope he takes a bread, a, a luncheon plate instead of a dinner plate. When I was in the restaurant, I uh, worked as a best boy and a waiter. You know, we had different size plates for different banquets. So, you know, a smaller meal, less expensive. It was a lunch plate. It's a smaller plate because it's a portion smaller. This miser is thinking, oh, I hope he takes a lunch plate instead of a dinner plate. He doesn't really want you eating a lot of his food because then there'll be less left for him. So his heart is not in it. But he said, help yourself. Take seconds if you want. Whatever you want, it's all for you. His motive, though, is if, he, if you're wooed by his feigned generosity, then maybe you can do him a favor. Maybe you'll be generous to him, do him something, give him something, whatever. But scripture says that type of person is a person whose pursuit in life is wealth. And so they have a kind of a bankrupt life. They're a miser. The, the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And one of those evils is I'm a miser. I can't help any of it. I'm good for nothing. Wow, that's just, that's something we need to avoid. We don't want to be entangled with a person like that. Like he says, he says, eat and drink, but his heart is not with you. Remember we talked last week about the heart. Watch over your heart for out of it flow the issues of life. That was in Proverbs 4. And we just talked about the heart being the center of a person's being. So where his heart is the center, it's not with your welfare and being caring to you and being generous to you. No way. His heart is focused on himself says, even what you've eaten, you're going to throw up. <laughs> I like the, he gets right down to it. He doesn't mince words here. The morsel you have eaten, you will vomit up and waste your pleasant words. This is not a man you want to keep company with, is what Solomon is saying. We need to be wise about wealth. You know, we can't get away from it. It's something we need. It's a, it's a you know, we need it for commerce. We need it to buy our groceries, pay our bills, our mortgage or rent, whatever, um, clothing, you name it. We need wealth. Okay, we need money. But we don't want money to have us. So money itself, remember I said, is not the problem. It's our attitude towards it. So let me ask you something. If you feel miser tendencies coming on, I'll be honest with you. There's been times where I was stingy with stuff. And, oh, I don't want to waste that. And, and uh on this person, I don't think it's worth it, or they're just going to waste it anyway. That's a bad attitude. Usually the Holy Spirit just gets a hold of me and says, listen, Brian, man, that is that is not of me. You know, you need to change your attitude. You know, when um, we, have a, we have some little children in our neighborhood that like to come over, and my wife invites them in and gives them snacks and stuff like that, and, you know, sometimes they're thinking, oh, no, I just bought that bag of cookies, and all these kids are coming, and, and they, that's a miserly attitude. It's like, eat as many as you want. I, you know, I haven't said that to them. But I, if I'd said that on some days, I would have been just like this miser. Eat as many cookies as you want. But my heart wasn't in it. So that's a check and a balance. We should listen to what the Holy Spirit's saying to us. If we're, you know, saying one thing and we're feeling something else. And if you are feeling that, that, oh, I don't want to part with it. That's not a good place to be. Let that be a flag. Let that be the clarion call from God to say, you know something, I got to have an adjustment to take place here in my life with my attitude towards wealth. I don't want to be good for nothing, which was what the meaning of that word was for miser. I mean, well, I'm not a miser. I give my money, but you could still, we could still be giving some of our money, but we're kind of grudgingly giving it. That's miserly. 
And if it's miserly, it's good for nothing. God loves a cheerful giver. That's what he said in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. You know, uh, do not give reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So check your heart on that. Um, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to go to the Lord's table today. You know, God was not a miserly giver, that's for sure. He gave lavishly in giving us his son to be our savior, who poured out his life blood, gave up his own flesh for our for our healing and for our redemption. Wow, God was the most generous giver of all. So let's pray, and then we'll go right into the Lord's table today. Father, we're so thankful for these frank words of scripture. The, you know, Solomon didn't mince words when he said this stuff. And Solomon was a very, very wealthy man. He was the wisest man in the world at one time. He was also the richest man in the world at one time. And I'm sure there was, he, he battled with this, but Lord, you gave him instruction to pass on to us. Help us to be careful with our material things. Help us to hold on loosely to the things of this world. Help us to value relationships far above wealth and material things. And also, Holy Spirit, we pray that when we're getting to that point where we're acting stingy, acting miserly, would you just kick us a little bit in the backside? Remind us to say, you know, don't, that's not a place we want to go. You know, we need to change that attitude. Help us, Lord, in our whole attitude to wealth. We don't want to love money. We want to love others and use money to be a blessing to them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you've got your uh, communion elements ready, and I hope you do, I want to read you a verse here from John 6, verse 35. Then I want to read you something from this little devotional called We Would See Jesus. And then we're going to celebrate the Lord's table together. You know, um, here's what Jesus said in John 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. I'm the bread of life, Jesus said. Let me read something to you. You know, it's, it's the first Sunday in October. In Canada, next weekend is Thanksgiving weekend. So I don't know what your plans are with, with your family or whatever, if you're going somewhere or having a big feast, uh, whatever. But um, let, this is entitled, How Can We Call This a Supper? Turkey and dressing, hot bread, heaping bowls of mashed potatoes and green vegetables, pumpkin pie and fruit salad. To even think of the menu for Thanksgiving dinner is enough to make our mouths water and our stomachs rumble. Thanksgiving is a time when we acknowledge the good things God has bestowed on us. Perhaps we eat more food on that day than any other day of the year. We may feel sheepish about the way we stuff ourselves and question such indulgence when we realize that countless other human beings are seriously malnourished. On the other hand, we may feel that this one day of overdoing is excusable since we share what we have with the needy throughout the year. But the point we want to make today is that the Lord's Supper seems to contrast with our Thanksgiving dinner. This is a meal consisting only of unleavened bread and grape juice. And each of us partakes of only a tiny amount of those food items. Probably seems ludicrous to an outsider to hear us refer to this as a supper. But these foods, so these food items, these emblems, speak about our abundant salvation. They speak of the abundant life Jesus promised in John 10, verse 10, where he said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. They speak of God's abundant provision for our spiritual needs here on earth. Paul said in Ephesians 3, verse 20, that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. So there is an abundance here that the eye of flesh cannot see. I'm glad he said that. Um, there's an abundance here just represented in these emblems that the eye can't see. When you're in the kitchen, I remember growing up seeing my mom cook Thanksgiving meal. Oh, man, it was just a huge amount of food, and, and it was incredible. We always left stuffed. So it doesn't compare with the amount here, and yet what this symbolizes far exceeds any Thanksgiving feast you and I are going to enjoy next weekend, if you're a Canadian. If you're an American, a few weeks down the road. So I invite you to take your elements with you at this time. And uh, we're going to celebrate the Lord's table together. You can get your bread, which is maybe a cracker or a piece of bread, whatever you've got. I've got this wafer. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for the Lord's Supper. It really is a feast. It's not a feast for our physical bodies, but it is a feast for our soul because of represent, what it represents. Thank you, Jesus, that you gave your own body on the cross to bear our sickness 
and carry away our diseases, and by your stripes we are healed. We take this way for this bread today, representing your body. We take it with gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your cup, whatever you're using there at home, or wherever you may be. Let's pray as well. Again, Father, we thank you for the wonderful gift of salvation that was wrought for us on the cross of Calvary by Jesus. He poured out every drop of his blood. It's a feast of a different sort, a feast where our souls are satisfied to the point of overflowing with abundance. It's the greatest gift of all, Father, that you would give us your son and you would pour his blood out for our sins. Thank you for washing us. Thank you for cleansing us. Thank you for calling us and adopting us into your family by your shed blood on the cross, Lord Jesus. We take and drink with gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen. Communion is such a very special thing, and um, we should never take it for granted. It's God's greatest gift to us. God was not a stingy giver at all, and we shouldn't be either. So let's keep working on that, friends. You know, um, let's keep asking God if... Help us to hold loosely onto the things of this world and hang tightly onto the promises of God. See you next week.